His is a fascinating story. Born in a country that no longer exists, raised in a family that repeatedly had to run from the authorities on account of their faith, he's a pastor, an evangelist, a media evangelist, and much more. His name is Pastor Peter Kulikov, and this is Our Conversation. Pastor Kulikov, thank you very much for joining me. It's my honor. I hardly know where to start with you. We could start today and that'd be great. We could go way back and that'd be good. So I think we're going to start somewhere near the beginning, maybe even before the beginning. Tell me where you're from originally and we'll start digging in that direction. I was born in the Soviet Union, which, as you mentioned, does not exist anymore. My father was secretly operating as a pastor in Kazakhstan. My mom and dad had five children at that time. And then my mom shared with my dad that she was expecting another child, the fifth one. And that was the time when my dad was pushed by the authorities to Uzbekistan. And um, that's a big story. I don't know how much time you have, but... Yeah, that's a huge story. Tell me what was going on at that time that your dad, working as a minister, had to basically run ahead of the authorities to get from one place to another. We're talking about what was the Soviet Union. Um, I, I think it's true for many of us in the, in the West. We know about the Soviet Union, but we really don't know much. We just know facts. We don't know much. We don't know anything from experience. So tell me what it was like, what your dad was going through, and what living conditions were like, and what ministry was like then. Uh, my dad's dad, my grandfather, whose name was also Peter, was a pastor, also secretly working as a pastor during the times of communism, when churches could not meet publicly, openly, when you were not allowed to give Bible studies to anyone, when KGB would be watching your every step, knowing that you have some Christian literature in your hands. That was the time when my grandfather, living in central Russia, was arrested. Actually, the second time. He already spent his first term, three years in labor camps and in prison. So that comes the second time that he is arrested again. At that time, my future father was about 19, 20 years of age. So his dad is being arrested, tried, and so my dad shared with me as he wanted to see his dad maybe the last time before he would be taken to Siberia to one of those camps. So he's trying to get into the building where his dad is being tried and sentenced and there are authorities and military and police not letting him in. But one of the guards was really nice to him, sort of like an angel maybe, provided by God. So he takes my dad into the basement of that building and he says, when they finish the trial, we'll be taking your dad into the basement of that building. So if you stand here in that hallway, you may see him before he's taken away. So my dad is standing there waiting and they sentenced his dad, my grandfather, to 10 years of uh, prison and labor camps just because he was giving Bible studies to someone. And they're taking him downstairs into the basement. And as he's passing by uh, this hallway, my future father at that time looked into the eyes of his dad. And his dad noticed him. He turned to him and he said, be faithful to the Lord. Be prepared. They'll come after you very soon. And that's what actually happened. They did come after my future father when he was only 20 years of age. He was giving Bible studies to two students of a local college, just helping them understand what the Bible was all about. And so the KGB officers came and arrested him and his brother at the same time, the same day. So your grandfather, he was arrested and sentenced to 10 years. He served those 10 years? He served those 10 what, years. What's that, what's that like for a family uh, being without a dad who was imprisoned, what we would say unjustly, uh, imprisoned according to the laws of that land? But we would say this is, this is devastating to be arrested and imprisoned for such a thing. For a family to go through that, what's that experience like? 
they all had strong faith and that faith was carrying them through. They would lose their income. They, they had to survive with no food, basically. Um, and they had to live in that expectation that any moment someone may come and take them also. Still, they would be strong in their faith and that faith would give them the energy and the power uh, to look forward and to know they were God's children they will be okay no matter what happens. That still, even today, looking back, is an example to me because we know persecutions may come and we look f into the future. I don't want to live in fear. Right. If I'm the child of God, God will take care of me. It may be hard. It may be difficult. So, yes, my, my dad was a young man at that time. His brother was a young man. They were still doing whatever they could to preach the gospel. They never were stopping. They were not living in fear. Their mom was suffering so much because, again, her husband was taken away. She did not have any means to support the family, so they were struggling. So how did the family get by? There's no breadwinner, no provider. But God was there for them and church members. Those sweet ladies, they would cook a little here, a little there, bring into their home and, and share whatever little that they had. They would share with one. That was like an early church. You know, yeah. they were there to share whatever little they had. Yeah. There's a point I want to come back to, but I want to ask this question first. So your dad and your uncle were sentenced. How long did they? So go my away dad for? was sentenced to five years and he was sent to serve the term in northern Kazakhstan, which is right under Siberia. His brother was also in one of the labor camps, and it was hard. Even before his sentencing, my dad had to be for six months in the basements of the KGB building, just waiting for the outcome. They would not allow him to sleep during the day, but uh, as soon as the time to sleep comes, he would be in that cell with like a bunch of other criminals. They would take him for interrogation and they would interrogate him for hours and hours during the night time. And then they let him go back into the cell for the last hour before the, the night time is over. And so he sleeps for that one hour. They wake him up again. They're not allowing to sleep the whole day until 10 or 11 in the evening. And then they allow just one hour when the person just falls asleep, they take him again for interrogation. And they were trying to make him give up some names of church members, other pastors who were giving Bible studies. But he said he was so exhausted by the end of those six months that he didn't care if they would just shoot him. I mean, he was ready to die. He said, I just wanted it to finish and to know my sentence and to go and to serve that term no matter what. Your dad went on to become, what's the right way? A pillar, a rock, a giant in the work in the, in the Soviet Union and then uh, post-communism Russia. Talk to me a little bit about your, your dad, what he was like and, and his ministry. Whenever I think about my dad is how much he loved God's Word. That was everything for him. You know, he, he loved biblical languages, he loved Greek, he loved old Hebrew and German and English because all that was helping him to get to, to the meaning of the biblical text. That's all that he cared. That was his priority. He wanted to read the scripture. He was teaching us as children to read the scripture and to memorize scripture. And uh, he was collecting books that he would secretly acquire from here and there, and he would be hiding them in the outhouse that we had in the backyard between two floors, that he would keep those books there, bring them home when it was dark at night and read those books. He loved God's word. So when he was taken to prison and to the labor camp, all he wanted to have some access to God's word, but they would not allow him to have his Bible or even a page from the Bible. So if, um, if uh, there was any chance that he would have at least a few verses from the Bible, that would be if his mom would smuggle something in, in a package that would be sent once every six months. He was allowed to receive a package from his family. So he wrote a letter to his mom saying, next time when you send me something, send me bread. He said, just send me bread. He knew she would understand. He meant spiritual bread. Yes. And so finally he says he was called into the office and there was a box on the table and the officer was opening the box, just checking what's inside. 
to be sure that there is no literature, nothing that was not allowed in the labor camp. And so my dad says he pulled out a bag with flour and he started poking inside, trying to see if there was anything. And my dad said he was standing by the table. He knew there would be something inside, but he was just praying for a miracle. And that miracle happened because finally when the officer gave him that box, he took it into a private place where he was and opened that flower at the very bottom of that bag. He found a few pages from the Gospel of John, folded neatly, nicely. He said he opened it. He didn't care about food that was sent. Nothing mattered to him except for reading the scripture that he loved so much. He said he memorized every word from those two or three chapters that his mom sent. About what year was this? That was uh, late 40s. So let me ask you this. No one welcomes the idea of persecution. I don't think there's too many people who run towards it. This was a very difficult time. It's a, it a geographically a difficult place. The winters are biting and, and, and hard. It wasn't modern. There weren't modern conveniences. Uh, your, your parents would never have lived in luxury homes or, or maybe even by our standards, comfortable homes. Right. Let me ask you this. When it comes to a person's faith, tell me about the role of persecution what it does for people. Because what I want to say is, what I'm trying to say, but I'm trying to find the right words, is it all bad? What I mean is this. I, I know it's unjust and inhumane. Sure. But what I'm saying is this. We've seen in various parts of the world how when the church operates under difficult circumstances, it seems to sometimes be healthy and vibrant. There have been cases when the governmental persecution dies away, that the church isn't quite so vibrant. What is it about, I'm going to use that word persecution, that sometimes seems to grow a person's faith? I shared with you a few stories about my dad or my grandfather, but I had to go to a communist school where atheism was taught. And for me, coming from a Christian family, that was a test of my faith every day. So our parents, mom and dad, before sending us to school, there were, homeschooling was not an option. The Christian schools didn't exist. It was a communist state. So they would gather us together and pray over us and send us to school. And uh, coming there to school, I had to stand for my faith every day, being seven years of age. Being in that first grade, I had to remember, I'm a Christian, I'm different. And that was inspiring me, motivating me to study, to learn more for myself so that I would have the answers when the teachers would try to humiliate me, intimidate me in front of the whole school. And there were many of those situations when they put me in front of the whole school and questioned me about my faith, about my church, about my God. I had to have the answers. I had to be prepared. That's where I believe persecutions help us realize who we are. We, we learn to live in that resistance. And that resistance is sort of like a vaccination uh, against the complacency. Like, I don't care, you know, my mom and dad are Christians, so I'm fine, I go to church, I'm fine. That does not exist. You speak for yourself. You are there, uh, doesn't matter what age you are, you have to have the answers, to give the answer why you go to church, what makes you a Christian in front of those who would laugh at you, right? Straight into your face, boys and girls. who You want to be popular in school, naturally, but, but you are there and they make fun of you. But that's where I was learning what prayer is all about. I was learning to trust that God will give me the right words. And I come home and I would study. At eight years of age, nine, I would come to my dad and say, why is that so? Like, how can I explain about the creation of the world and, and about the Bible? Is it all fictional? And so my dad would be very thorough, you know, like helping me to find the sources. He would not just say, just because I say so. He was a man of study. He was very academic in his approach to theology. So he would use classical literature and he would read to us the books of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, those who were accepted and recognized even in that communist environment. But 
he would find stories and statements of those authors and he would say, if they ask you, you quote from Dostoevsky and, and show to them that even he believed in God or, or read to them from Tolstoy. And that was really helpful. And I would be so excited that, yes, there are people of authority who believed in God. So persecution was helping all of us to grow in our faith, to study for ourselves, not to rely upon the faith of our moms or dads or grandparents, but to find our faith for ourselves and to know who we are and to have that vaccine. I'll repeat that word, you know, because we had to be resistant. Yes, yes. And that was helping our churches to have courage in those days and times, not to live in fear. Persecution was there, but people did not think about persecution. Church members cared about giving Bible studies. They cared about baptism, secret baptisms, yes. hiding from the authorities, but still to go and to see the church grow. Let me ask you this, because I asked you about your grandfather and about your father. But there's somebody I don't want to overlook, and she must have been a remarkable person at that time, and of course still today. Tell me about your mother and your mother's role through all of this. My mom was a person of faith, and she is. She's still living, so that's a blessing. Amen. She loved God's Word so much, and her faith was very simple, very sincere. She was not the person of going and preaching, but she had a, f a full faith. I mean, she trusted God's Word so much that her life was an example to us, and she would always inspire us to pray. She believed in prayer. She would gather us together and pray. So it was by her hard work, her faithfulness, and her example. She believed in church ministry. She was supporting our dad. Who was a pastor. She was ready to suffer. She was ready to lose him, but she was ready for that, knowing God will provide, God will take care. So she was never losing faith or courage. And for me, that's still an example today, mm. uh, looking at her. And uh, even now, she loves to read God's Word, when, or she loves watching. I mean, it is written in Russian. She would watch it on that little TV that is there, and she would recognize faces. She's not doing that great physically, but her faith is still strong. It must have been very difficult for a, for a young woman to farewell a husband going off to a, a prison camp or a, a, a prison of some kind, hard labor. John, if we have a few extra minutes uh, in this program, I want to share with you how my mom and dad met. And that's a very interesting story in itself, showing faith and trust. That's a good idea. Why don't we do that next? My guest is Pastor Peter Kulikov, uh, born in the Soviet Union. To this day, a man of God, a pastor, an evangelist. In just a moment, I'm going to ask Peter uh, Kulikov about his role in media evangelism, how he got into ministry, how media evangelism came to the Soviet Union. The story is miraculous, and you'll be amazed. And of course, we need to find out that uh, fascinating story about how his parents met. We'll be back in just a moment. He is Pastor Peter Kulikov. I'm John Bradshaw. This is Our Conversation. Unless you or someone close to you has experienced it, the pain of miscarriage can be difficult to comprehend. How do you navigate the disappointment, the emotional pain of losing something, someone, that represents your biggest hopes and dreams? Don't miss Innocence Lost, a biblical look at the challenging subject of miscarriage, a subject that touches more lives than most people imagine. You'll meet someone who's experienced the difficulty of miscarriage. Clinging to the truth of God's Word even when your heart doesn't feel it was absolutely the most important thing we could have found. And we'll hear from an expert whose insight has helped many families. Everything that's developing initially has to be just right because it's such a critical foundation for the development of that baby. And we'll hear from the Word of God as the Bible provides light and hope in the midst of a bitter challenge. Innocence Lost, brought to you by It Is Written TV. Thank you for remembering that It Is Written exists because of the kindness of people just like you. To support this international life-changing ministry, please call us now at 800-253-3000. You can send your tax-deductible gift to the address on your screen, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. Our number again is 800-253-3000, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. 
Welcome back to Conversations. My guest is Pastor Peter Kulikov. Pastor, I want to ask you in just a moment about how you end up in ministry. We'll talk about media evangelism because in Russia, you were right on the front lines there and, and, and uh, instrumental in bringing It Is Written to Russia. But let's go back. You wanted to talk about um, how your parents met. I'm, I'm fascinated. Right. I wanted to hear about this. So, as I mentioned earlier, my dad was sentenced to five years of labor camps and prison time because he was a pastor. He was giving Bible studies. So, he served his five years in northern Kazakhstan. And then finally, the time came for him to be released. He comes to the office of the prison ward uh, to get his papers. But instead, there is a document on the table stating that now he's sentenced to eternal banishment, eternal exile in one of the small villages, and he's not allowed to go back to his home. He cannot go back to Russia. He had to stay permanently in one of the small villages in northern Kazakhstan. And so they just gave him a few little things that he had and sent him to that village there. No one even spoke Russian there. They were all local native Kazakh people over there. And it was there that by a miracle he met someone who was from Germany, who lived there, spoke some German. My dad learned German while in prison because there were prisoners of war in, uh, in, in, the, in prison at that time. So he settled there, was very discouraged, like a human being. He was a young man, but he could not go back to his church. He couldn't go back to his ministry. He was locked permanently and forever in that uh, remote area. And I asked my dad later on, so how did you feel at that time? He said, there were moments of frustration, like, why, Lord, why is that happening to me? Why can't I go back? And those questions were very real. He sure. was a human being oh, yeah. and with yeah, no doubt. emotions, like right. all of us. He was 27 at that time. So uh, he knew somehow that there was a nearby city where possibly there were some few Seventh-day Adventists in that area, but he, he was not allowed to travel there. He couldn't. He had to stay there, and if he would break that rule, then he would be sentenced to another 25 years of labor camp. So he had no choice, but there was uh, someone in the hospital there. Uh, I mean, not a hospital. It was just a small clinic there who felt like he needed some checkup and, um, in, the, in the bigger place. And um, they, they really felt he was a good man. And so that medical person from that clinic wrote him a permission for medical reasons to travel to that nearby city and to spend a few hours just doing whatever he needed to do. It happened so that in that city, which was not a big city, but still, there was just one, or maybe, I may be wrong, two or three families of uh, Seventh-day Adventists and in one of that families was a young lady, and her name was Anna. And uh, she was 19 at that time. She was very pretty. She was in school, and there were many young men who wanted to date her, and they would uh, want to have her as their girlfriend. And, uh, but she was raised as a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist, and she always wanted her future friend, partner, husband, to be a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist. And she was very sincere, very sincere in praying and saying, Lord, I need someone who shares my faith. I don't want anyone else. And that she was very determined in, in that respect. She talked to her parents about it, that I don't want anyone but just someone who loves the Lord and has the same faith as I do. And she was so committed and faithful and trusting that one night as she was sleeping, she had a dream. And in that dream, she heard the voice saying, your husband will be Michael Kulikov. She never heard that name before. She never knew anyone by that name. She woke up, talked to her mom and dad, and they were like, you're probably desperate to get married, and that's why you're having those dreams. And Time passed by and they forgot her parents, but she didn't. And so one afternoon they were at home and someone knocked on the door. 
And that was a young man who traveled from that village to that city, started asking people about Sabbath-keeping family in that city, and they directed him to that house. So he came, he knocked on the door, had no idea what that family was all about and who the people were in that house. And he walks in and he introduced himself and he said he was a prisoner of the Soviet Union government because of his faith. He was a Seventh-day Adventist and he was looking for a family that shares his beliefs. And he said, I'm Michael Kulikov. And so you imagine that that young lady didn't run to him saying, finally, the Lord answered my prayer. No, she kept it quiet to herself, but she was just fascinated. She was so like she couldn't believe anything that was happening. And um, so they spent a few hours together. They gave him food. They prayed together, had a little Bible study. He had to leave. So he left, but he said, I'll try to see if I, I would be able to come again in two weeks again. So he got that permission again from that medical person, traveled again to that city in two weeks. They had another Bible study, just a few, maybe two, three hours together. And um, he looked at that young lady and she said, I'll, I'll be walking to the bus stop. Would you walk with me, please? And she did walk with him. And as they were walking, he said, I'll try to come again. But uh, when I come again, would you have your passport ready? Because I want us to get married, he said. And she looked at him and she said, okay, I'll be ready. <laughs> Just like that. Just like that. And so the third or the fourth time, I don't remember exactly, he came there. They went to the local city hall and they got married. And... Uh, that was about the time when Stalin died. And so an amnesty was given to all the prisoners uh, who were persecuted for religious beliefs. And so my dad was released from that eternal exile. And now being married to this young woman, uh, they uh, started ministry together and they continued serving in uh, Kazakhstan as a young pastor and his wife. Uh, and their whole life, they lived together, if I remember correctly, 56 years. Fantastic. And my mom is still living, and she still loves her husband, like he's still with her. Yeah, wonderful. So God leads us. Yes, you know, he does. And he blesses us if we trust him. He makes miracles today like it was in the Old Testament. That, that's miraculous. As the father of a daughter, I, I don't know if I'm excited or concerned about the story <laughs> you told me, but wow, what, a, what an amazing story. Now, somewhere along the line, you entered the picture. You were raised knowing knowing and experiencing what had happened to your grandfather and, and your dad i'd like you to talk to me about your your call to ministry i imagine accepting that call was a, was a pretty heavy thing let's talk about how you got started in ministry and and why i had great respect for my uh, family my grandfather who was a pastor my my dad who was a pastor and being young, I, I always wanted to be a pastor. And so I'm not saying there was no like the moment of God calling me. But I remember I was seven years old and I talked to my dad. I said, I want to be a pastor. I want to be like you. So in my heart, I mean, maybe like Samuel. I mean, he was young and yeah. he was called. So it's not necessarily when you're 20 or 25 that you get that call. But I believe that call came when I was seven and it was clear to me. I never questioned that. I always knew I want to preach God's word no matter what. Of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, those, those moments and times of persecution at school and then in the military, I had to serve in the military. Mm. That was an, not an option for me at that right. time. I believe it was the time when I was drafted to serve in the Soviet Union army being taken away from the warmth of my Christian home, from that safety, of the spiritual safety, I mean, and then my church and being far away in the company of all those other guys who were good people, but they were of a different upbringing. They were all smoking and drinking and cursing, and I felt like a stranger among them. But I was allowed to have my small New Testament with me, and I would... I remember I was uh, on the train taking me away to the Ural Mountains where I was assigned to serve. And sitting in that train car, 
which was full of smoke of the other guys smoking and drinking, just being drafted. They were still, we were all like freshmen at that moment. I was still sitting with my New Testament and, and reading to myself. I didn't feel I belonged to that group. But what's amazing, I realized at that moment that God can be with us in weird places. So just imagining God being in that smoke and drinking and cursing. He was there. Sure. He was there for me. And as I was sitting and reading, I found peace. I found peace. God is here. God is with me and he needs me. And that moment again, like never before, I realized, yes, it's great to have a father or a mother who are Christians, but now I, I feel the hunger for it personally. I need it myself. I need God in my life in that strange foreign environment of being taken away from my home. I was 18 at that time and I, re I, I noticed on that train as one guy stopped by being a little drunk, he asked me what I was reading and I showed him my New Testament and I said, I'm reading the Bible. And he turned to the other guy and said, hey, he's reading the Bible. I mean, and they got interested and they, uh, there was a circle around me and they asked me to read. And I started reading while on the train with those strangers around me. That was another affirmation for me. You know, I want to be a pastor. I want to preach the gospel, not just to those clean guys, you know, in nice suits and ties, but those real people that, that need God. They want to know and to hear about him. So those two years of being away from my family, my church, affirmed that I'm called, I need to serve the to, Lord. To talk about what ministry was like, I mean, existing in ministry in those days in, in Russia. You know, today, let's say in this country, they attend college, they get a degree, they might get sponsored to the seminary. They'll go and, and be employed by the church and the pastors we work with at least, don't get paid a million dollars, but receive a living wage and there might be uh, an allowance for this and for that. So there aren't very many pastors where we are who live in poverty. What was it like then? It was totally different because you could not officially work for the church. You had to have a government job, which was for many pastors being a photographer that would allow them to travel you know, or sweeping streets. And that's what I was doing. I was actually sweeping streets because that would give me, I had to do that early in the morning. So that would give me some extra time during the day to, to be involved in church ministry and to do God's work. So yes, that's how I started. I was actually waxing floors in one of the restaurants and sweeping streets. And I, I got married early. I was uh, just 20, me and my wife. And we started our own life, had to support ourselves. We lived in, in a for God forgotten place. I mean, it was in the attic, no windows, basically, bed bugs everywhere running from the neighbors. And we didn't have anything, but we, we knew the Lord, we knew one another, we felt God put us together. We were excited. We had our youth meetings, we would come together in that attic room and uh, with no running water, no hot water, no cold water. And we had a baby over there with nothing, no diapers, no water, the outhouse outside in cold weather. We were excited still. I mean, we, we felt blessed that we know the Lord, we can still do his work. We didn't care about all the, the other things that seem are so important to us now. We, we were happy that we had those, those, we were not hungry. We would have some bread and other things to eat, but we never cared that much about the physical blessings that we enjoy so much now. But God was there and God was opening doors. Uh, I started more as in the local church and the literature work. And it was all like typing books. And I was doing a lot of translation, mm -hmm. translating Sabbath school quarterlies, translating some uh, uh, literature for our pastors. So the church asked me officially in the, so that was the very beginning when I officially became working for the church. It was more doing translations uh, yeah. into Russian and then having people who would type those books and they were risking their lives. Mm, 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 mm. I'll ask you this and I want to come back to the books. You got involved in media evangelism. Let's fast forward down to getting involved in media and your association with It Is Written. Uh, the media work uh, was something that we could not even dream about. That was just in our prayers and in our thoughts because media was controlled by the government. And there were just two networks and both belong to the government and 
cable networks of radio and television that would go into every house. And people had just two options, channel one or channel two, both atheism, communism, controlled by the government. Imagining that we would be able to preach the gospel on radio or television was just totally a crazy thought, you know, which would never come into anybody's, anybody's head. But then that was just the time of big changes in Russia. You know, Gorbachev came to power and I was uh, 24 at that time or maybe even 23, don't remember exactly. But I remember as my dad talked to me and he said, the church needs to start the media work and we need to send you to Guam, he said, oh, because yeah. that's where AWR is and that's where we want you to start preparing uh, sermons in Russian. And I, that day I talked to my dad and said, I don't want to go to Guam. I want to start it here. I want to start it on our own Russian Soviet Union land. I traveled to Moscow, went to the Ministry of Communication, met with the Secretary for Communication, and I said, as a church, we want to start the media work and we need a license. So can you give us a license? You know, that boldness that you have when you're 23, 24, sure. that goes away when you're 57, you know, unfortunately. But I mean, I was overwhelmed with what God can do because basically he gave me the paper to uh, fill out the application. That was a time of big changes in the Soviet Union. And the old communist system was collapsing. The new one was coming to the surface. So I filled out the application. A few days after that, he called me uh, from, I mean, someone called me from his office and they said, we approved your application and you have license number one, uh, number five. They said, you have license number five. So that's after the Russia Channel 1, Russia Radio 2, and Russian television. So after all those Russian government networks, they issued number five license for the whole Russia, and it was given to the media center that I was starting in Russia. That's, that's a miracle of, I mean, you can hardly get your head around that. Yeah, that was a miracle. I still see that as a miracle. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so what did you do next? Now you, you have a license, now you've got to run a, oh, as a matter of fact, We'll pause because I, I, when we come back from the break, I want you to tell me about that. You, you were bold enough to go to the Ministry of Broadcasting, or whatever it might have been called, and they said, yes, here's a license yes. after you went through certain procedures. Now, what do you do with that? There's an enormous country that has to be reached. It had to be reached. And Peter, now with a license in his hand, had to scratch his head and say, so what do we do next? I'm interested in finding out what he did next, and I know you are too. I'll be back with Pastor Peter Kulikov in just a moment. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is Our Conversation. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV. They're watching their favorite It Is Written programs, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free anytime on Roku, Apple TV, and at itiswritten.tv. It was 1882 in Western North Carolina when 19 men and boys drowned in the Tuckaseegee River in what was a terrible accident. It was an accident that should never have happened. In post-slavery America, the men, like so many others, had been leased to the state as cheap labor. Convict leasing existed in the United States for decades. The practice calling into question our notions of freedom. Don't miss Free Indeed, filmed on location in North Carolina. As we look into the subject of freedom and ask the question, are you really free? Find out where true freedom can be found and learn that you don't have to be a slave to the old life. Watch Free Indeed on It Is Written TV. What does the Bible say about astrology? Why do bad things happen to good people? What color is Jesus? 
If you have a question, we'd love to find an answer for you from the Bible. Line up online from It Is Written TV. This is Conversations, uh, and I'm back with Pastor Peter Kulikov. A moment ago, Peter, you said that you went to the authorities in Moscow, received a license to start broadcasting. You've got this massive country, this huge population, and a license. Somehow you had to put the two together. So what did you do? First, I had to acknowledge that at that moment, there were no other religious broadcasts in Russia. No other church, no other ministry was doing any broadcasting. So here am I, a young man, uh, praying for a miracle. And there was a local cable network in the city of Tula, which was, again, controlled by the government. And uh, we did not have a studio. We did not have any equipment, nothing. So I, I prayed, and the Lord impressed me to go to the general manager of that network. Uh, uh, I go to his office. Uh, Ask the secretary to see the boss, the manager, and she asked me what for, and I said, I want to offer a good Christian program. And um, she looked at me like I fell from the moon, and she went and talked to the general manager there, and he called me into the office, looked at me like, who are you? You know, like, he, when, uh, he actually laughed at me. He said, you know, we've never had any religious programming, and it's not even allowed. It was never allowed. And I looked at him and I said, you'll be the first one. I said, imagine how your network will be the first one to have a religion. And he laughed again. He was, he was a good guy. I mean, he was a communist party leader in that region. He had a communist uh, ID in his pocket and he pulled it out. He said, look, I'm a communist and you offer me a Christian program. And I said, but isn't that what our nation needs now more than anything? And, and again, he laughed, you know, like in a good way. He said, uh, let's let's see what we can do. He called the programming director and he said, here's a young man offering us a Christian program. So can we find a place in our programming? And the man, I mean, his boss is talking to him. He said, yeah, we can, we can find a time for, for them. So he asked me, what time would you want? I was not prepared to answer any of these questions. I was just, I, honestly, I did not even expect that they would listen to me. I just wanted to try. So they ask him about the time and the day. And I'm saying, what if it's Friday, right before the beginning of the Sabbath day? So I said, what about like 7 o'clock, 7.30 on Friday night? They looked around. They say, yeah, we have prime news at 8. So we, we can give you 7.40. So those 20 minutes, will that be enough for you? I said, that's plenty. I said, 20 minutes is great. So he says, okay, bring me your program. <laughs> and that moment I realized I don't even have an equipment to record the program. So now I looked at him and I said, you know what? I don't have a tape recorder. I don't have a microphone <laughs> to record anything. He almost fell off his chair. He said, you offered me a program. You have nothing to record it with. He calls the guy from the studio, like the studio manager. And he says, here's a young man. Can you give him some studio time here and uh, let him record his weekly program? And so they opened door. God opened those doors. Yes, he did. And so I went in and I recorded the first 20-minute program in the history of the communist Soviet Union, the first ever religious broadcast that was recorded, gave them the recording, gave them for the program, and um, they played it next Friday. I, I remember like it was yesterday. My wife and our kids were sitting in that small room by that radio that was a cable radio and we push the button and exactly at 7.40 we hear the trumpet sound and uh, the first Seventh-day Adventist, first ever Christian program in the Soviet Union started playing. A few months after that, uh, I met him. He was a little discouraged walking down from his office. I was on my way to record a new program and uh, he looked at me and he said, come with me, I need to talk to you. And he shared with me that he had a bad day and that, that day was like all going wrong. And he was criticized by some other Communist Party members. And he said, then I came back, I had the tape recorder here and I played your program here right in my office. I found hope, he said. I found encouragement. Listen, he said, tomorrow I go to Moscow. We have a, a meeting with all the other regional general managers of the other regional networks. And I want to offer your program to them. That's a communist speaking. He's saying uh, he's going and he will offer this program. We called it the voice of hope at that time. And uh, 
I said, that's incredible, of course. He says, bring me as many copies as you can. We are talking about real reels, remember yeah. the tape? Oh, yeah. Sure. And uh, at that time, we already were able to get two tape recorders with, you can make copies only in real time. Mm. So I'm thinking, I came home, it's already late. We, we don't have any offices, we don't have any studios. It's all in my bedroom. And so there's two kids, my wife, and I'm sitting next to those tape recorders and I'm making copies all night long, right in the place where we were making babies. We are now making programs for the programs to go on the Soviet Union uh, cable networks. By morning, I had about 12, if I remember right, copies made. And I rushed to that office. He said he'll be leaving at around seven in the morning. The driver would be there. I come and his car is there. I hand him his, those big boxes of those 12 programs. He takes him those with him. The next day I meet him and he tells me that he gave all those away and they all want this program on their networks. That's how God works. I mean, we, we read the book of Acts and we're saying, this is where the miracles, miracles are happening today if we are ready for those miracles. Yeah, no question about it. That's inspiring. There's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more I could ask you about, but I want to jump over into, into uh, another phase of your ministry. You emigrated to the United States where you live now, uh, but you travel back, you have traveled back very frequently to conduct evangelistic meetings. So talk to me about, about the reception, what you've seen change over time, what it was like to do meetings uh, in the former Soviet Union. I do travel, um, not now because of COVID restrictions, but before at least twice a year. But I, I have to say to you especially, John, that It Is Written was my inspiration from my early days of ministry. I had the privilege of seeing how George Vanderman was passionate about ministry, like uh, Pastor Mark Finley was excited about doing evangelism in Russia and in Ukraine, how um, I was standing next to Pastor Mark Finley in the Kremlin Palace relating his message in Russian language where those thousands and thousands of people were so desperate to get into that building. All that was an inspiration to me to dedicate my life to ministry and to do whatever I can to preach the gospel, even though I may be far away from my homeland. I, I still wanted to do that. And um, yeah, those, those were remarkable days right after the former fall, fall of communism when It Is Written was in the Kremlin. Yeah, It Is Written was very instrumental in uh, bringing attention to the Adventist church and to the message, because when the message was broadcasted from the very heart of the Kremlin, where all the communist party, no other church used ever that platform for preaching the gospel, but it was through the It Is Written that the Seventh-day Adventist church could, I mean, it was publicized everywhere. National newspapers were writing about it. People were flooding that building. And then again, uh, it is written in the Kremlin, I'm uh, not in the Kremlin, but in the Olympic Stadium with uh, dozens of thousands of people attending nightly. That was um, a breakthrough in evangelism because of It Is Written. And we are grateful to It Is Written. As, as a Russian person, I'm, I'm saying that. That was such a great uh, impact on me personally. We're thankful to God because you know how God put that all together, had the right people in the right places at the right time. Yes. And you continued with evangelism. So uh, talk about where you went or where you go and, and what that's been like over the years. Right. At least twice a year, I go either to Moldova or Ukraine or Russia or even Central Asia where I was born, like uh, uh, Kazakhstan, and would present a series of meetings, inviting people to come. Uh, things are changing. It's getting harder now to invite people to come to the meetings. Uh, there are certain prejudices. There are certain political events that uh, keep people away from coming. But I'm not giving up. I believe God called us to preach the gospel. And I see those dear souls searching for the gospel. They are very sincere. Uh, I was on a flight from Atlanta to Moscow and then to Kazakhstan, and I was exhausted. And um, I switched flights in Moscow, and that was my last flight to Almaty, where I had to start the meetings the next day. And I had about four and a half hours on that flight. It was a red-eye flight. And I thought, at least, finally, I can sleep for at least a couple of hours. 
And then someone sitting next to me, he's just nudging me and says, why are you going to Almaty? And of course he talked to me in Russian. And I said, I'm a pastor, I go to preach there. He looked at me and he said, my whole life I wanted to meet a pastor. I have so many questions to ask. I'm a professor from Moscow State University. And can we talk? Can we talk? And I said, okay, there goes my, my no, night's sleep. No sleeping down. No sleeping down. Oh, the whole flight, we, never, we did not stop talking for a minute. He was, he was sharing his heart. He was sharing his concerns. He, he, he went with me to the hotel where I was staying as I was checking in at 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning. He was there. He said, I, want more. I have more questions. I want to know more. He came and he brought his colleague to the meetings as we were doing the meetings. Uh, so another professor from the Academy of Science from Kazakhstan. And um, then he had to leave to back to Moscow. He did not, uh, somehow it happened, didn't have my address or my name. But I'm talking about real people, you know, real people who are searching for the Lord. I was preaching in um, Kiev in Ukraine, doing satellite evangelistic meetings. And someone called me. There were thousands of people calling for prayer requests and Bible studies. But that one call, I remember one of the pastors came to me. He said, someone called and left a message. Actually, it was one of the pastors from the Moscow church called. And he said, someone is looking for you. Someone is looking for you. So here's the phone number. And I called that phone number. And that was that same professor. Same man. Same man who was in Moscow. And um, he shared with me a very sad story. He said that his son died in a car accident a few months before. And he said he was so discouraged. He was so disappointed. And he was in the metro the, uh, in Moscow. And at one of the stations, one of the stations, he noticed someone was selling books, religious books. He stopped by that little booth and he looked at the books. He looked at the lady selling those books and he said, I looked in her eye, into her eyes and I asked her, do you know Peter Kulakov? And she said, of course, he's preaching over the satellite in my church in Moscow Come on. right now. No way. He took the address, he went there and he started attending those meetings over the satellite. And he said that was the only hope that he could find for his soul losing someone who was so dear to him. I don't know the rest of the story about this man, but he's just an illustration of how much people are searching, people of high ranks, high positions, uh, people of uh, those teaching, professors, engineers, simple people, elderly and young, they're searching for the answers. Mm. Even in that state that is becoming more and more under the influence of the Russian Orthodox Church that takes them away from the Bible, they want Bible answers. And that's what I do. Going there, I want to meet them personally and share the gospel of Jesus Christ coming soon. I've got a couple of questions for you in the short time that we have left. It's gone by too quickly. Um, looking into the future, how do you see the future of the church in, in Russia? I believe that our people will not give up. There are, there are big challenges, uh, very serious challenges with religious freedom and the limitations that they have. But I see courage that they, they lived through the time. Their parents, their grandparents lived through the times of persecution. Many of them personally were persecuted. So what they see now is not stopping them. They're not discouraged. They're not living in fear. And I believe this is something that our worldwide church needs to learn from them. I believe our church will continue to grow and do the ministry in whatever form and format and whatever ways there may be available, they will not stop preaching the gospel. And people are being baptized and they will continue being baptized because God has a message for that nation. I want you to encourage that person who didn't hear the voice of God saying, this is who you're gonna marry, didn't have a government official miraculously hand over a piece of paper, didn't have that person on the street asking about the person in the book. Miracles happen. Sometimes they're great big things that we talk about on TV and other times they're you know, your garden variety miracles, still miracles. God is yes. still working. Let's talk to that person for about 90 seconds. That person who wants to share his or her faith, maybe isn't sure how to go about it, isn't even sure how to recognize opportunities. What do you say to that person to encourage that one to share Jesus where she or he can? What, what I see happening in Eastern Europe, especially, they're getting more and more into secular uh, mentality. 
but with that they're losing courage uh, alcohol uh, is a big issue drugs is a big, a big problem over there and so we need hope and we need to see the light and this is what god's word is all about and this is my emphasis you know if you're losing hope if your husband is a drunk if if you feel you have no future in your family god has an answer and that's where i offer them the bible god's word and for the eastern europeans to read the bible is a big thing here in the united states we have bibles at homes so i lead them to god's word if they read god's word immerse themselves in god's word they find the truth they find hope they find courage and the answers that they are searching for when they find it for themselves then they excite they cannot keep it russians are very outgoing people they may seem stern and cold no when, when they're at home, they, they're very friendly with their neighbors. They would spend time uh, eating sunflower seeds together outside. And that's a big thing when they bond together. That's when they start sharing something. When they're excited about something, nothing can stop them. So when they read God's word for themselves, they get excited. They share it with someone else. And that's the main thing, to teach them to value, to love God's word. And then they share it with the others. Talk to me, last question for you about what Jesus means to you. You've had a, you've had a, a fascinating life, you've a, a rich heritage. Uh, your, your family history is, is quite astonishing. But everybody's got to come back to their relationship with Jesus. What does Jesus mean to you and how would you encourage somebody uh, to know Jesus and experience the cross? For me, Jesus was never uh, a, a, the a theology. You know, for me, Jesus is, is an experience. And uh, I, I feel his presence in my life every moment, and I see his blessings. Does it mean that I have no troubles? Does it mean that there are no challenges in my life? No, I do have challenges. We do have sickness in the family. We, we do get uh, issues that we need to deal with. But I see the blessing of Christ being present in my life daily. So I would encourage everyone to experience him on that level of he's real. He's with me. He's in the store. He's with me at work. He's in my church office. He's in my marriage. And my children see that. And when they see that, it's not the theology that makes them Christians. It is looking at their mom and dad and seeing what God can do and the presence of Christ can do in their marriage and their relationship and their happiness. They want that. They want that for themselves. Nothing can take them away from the Lord when they see Jesus being real in our daily sure. life. Yeah, he's real. He's been real in your life. He still is. He was at work and he's still at work. And I believe he's coming back soon. Pastor Peter Kulikov, thank you for taking time. I've been really blessed. It's been my honor. Thank, thank you. you for inviting me. And thank you for joining us. What a blessing this has been. He is Pastor Peter Kulikov. I'm John Bradshaw, and this has been our conversation. <laughs>